all right and welcome so we are going to take a look at the january 2020 paper one paper for csec biology and um it's gonna be um a quick review all right so that you can do some really quick revision in time for exam all right so first question we're looking at question one which of the following characteristics is used to distinguish insects from other arthropods. Let's see what we have here. We have number of legs, hairiness, color, and shape. Now remember, insects have a very specific qualification. They are defined by the number of legs that they have. Also number of segments, but segments is not one of the options here. Number of legs is one of the options. So therefore, we know for sure that the answer is A, all right, number of legs. Hairiness, that doesn't really tell you anything. Color, same thing, that doesn't really tell you anything. Shape, there's a wide range of shapes in that group. So question two, living organisms such as plants affected by abiotic factors, so it's in all caps, so we have to pay close attention to that. And what they're asking is affected to determine where they become established. Okay, so which of the following options describes some? So you have to define, so you have to look for an option that lists abiotic factors. So we'll put that in all caps. Right. So we know for sure it's not this because this has to do with biotic factors, which are essentially relationships between organisms. So A is out. All right, um, sunlight, soil, pH, minerals, these are all non-living factors, so it's possible. Sediment size, shape, and color, okay, they're, they're non-living factors, but uh, deforestation, slash, and burn, shifting up cultivation. These has to do with human activities, so they're definitely not abiotic factors. Um, with a stretch, they'd be considered biotic factors in terms of how human beings relate to the um, environment. So we're between A, we're between B and C. So let's look at the question again. It's asking about living organisms which are affected by abiotic factors, which determine where they become established. Which of the following options describes some of these determining factors? So between the two, we want to look for the one that gives factors that affect whether an organism is established in a given area. Now sediment size, so we're looking at soil here, right? So this most likely will have to do with soil. Um, shape of the soil, color of the soil isn't going to really have this. It's not going to have an impact on whether an organism is established in a given area. All right, so we know for sure we can get rid of C if for no other reason than this part here. So we know now that the answer is B. Sunlight availability is important. Soil pH is very important. We know some plants that prefer alkaline soil versus acidic soil versus close to neutral. And of course, minerals because plants need minerals for nutrition, right? They need their nitrates, etc. So that is question two. So the answer for question two, B. Let's go on to question three. All right, so question three is giving you a nice little flowchart diagram, flowchart-like diagram. All right, so far it looks like it's um, something similar to a food chain, food web. However, it has other factors in it, like it the sun. It has decomposers which are not usually added to a food chain. It's usually treated as separate from, and we have our inorganic nutrient pool. So if we're seeing a cycle, so okay, so we know it's not a food chain because we have a cycle here, at least part of it is a cycle, and we have the input from the sun, yes, so that would have an impact with respect to the flow of energy. So what we're seeing here is actually two things happening here. You have a food chain-like diagram that is showing you 
the flow of energy. So you have flow from the sun, right? You could probably say it's this black arrow here from sun to producers to consumers to decomposers, right? As well as we have energy lost by heat. Notice, however, that when we follow the black-headed arrows, it's one way. It's not coming back to the sun. Nothing is coming back there. Okay, energy is flowing in one direction. However, the lighter shaded arrow is definitely making a cycle. All right? So we have it starting here, going down, going across. It's including the inorganic nutrient pool. And you have a full cycle going on here, right? So what essentially is happening here is that they basically combined a diagram showing energy flow. Plus nutrient cycling, which is quite innovative, I must say, right? So they're combining the two in one diagram, yeah? And how you tell the difference is the whether the arrowheads are shaded or not. So now that we've looked at the diagram, because as I always tell students, when you get a diagram, analyze the diagram first. Take a good look at it, make sure you understand what's going on, and then look at the question, okay? So let's look at the question. Energy flow through ecosystems is not 100% efficient. True. Because why? Okay, so let's see what options they have. They have lost, drain, respiration, and excretion, recycled, circular, linear. Okay, so we know for sure energy flow is not circular. So we're not going to take this into account, right? That's, no, that's a no. Recycle, which also implies a cycle, a circle. That does not apply to energy flow, so we take that out. So we are stuck between A and D. Now, with D, energy flow is linear, right? It does move from one organism to the next. But remember, the question is asking, why is it not 100% efficient? That doesn't answer our question, right? So we are left with A, lost during respiration and excretion. And that is true. Energy is lost to the atmosphere, to the environment, via respiration and excretion, um, as well as heat. Right? So, therefore, the answer to this one is A. Right? So, let's move on. As I say, we're doing a thing. We're going at a pace. As, as pace, as much of a pace as I could manage. Right? Without, you know, missing some important points. And then we have number four. All right, so number four is just asking you where herbivores are most likely to be from. So herbivores, what do they do? They feed on plants, right? Plants are your producers, right? The producers are the first trophic level. Right, so therefore, if herbivores are the next point, so if you have your plants here, plants, and then you have your herbivores, right, so that's first and then second, right, so therefore your answer is B, second, all right, so let's go on to part four, sorry, question five. Commensalism, relationship between us. Uh, so first, let's define what is commensalism. Commensalism is when you have one side benefits, right? And the other side is neutral. It doesn't benefit and it isn't hurt. Okay, so it's neither nor. All right, and it's a partnership. Okay? between species. The other types are mutualism and parasitism. So which one of these is one where one benefits and the other is neither nor? Well, a dog and a flea. The flea benefits, the dog itches. So therefore, the dog is affected. So that's not that hen and a chick. Well, that's um, not even not even a symbiotic relationship. That is a parental. You have mother child so definitely no no 
Um, cowan egret versus man and mosquito. Man and mosquito, that's a parasitic effect. The man is the host, the mosquito is the parasite. Cow and egret, this is the one. Egrets benefit, cows couldn't be bothered, right? So, answer is C. Okay, so let's go on to number six. So, we have here a food web. So, as I said, look at the diagram first. Make sure you understand it. So, we can see here, this is our first, um, our first trophic level. This is our second trophic level, right? Squirrel and iguana. And then hawk and arm um, ocelot is your third trophic level. So you have your producers, you have your primary consumers, and you have your secondary consumer. All right? So we know the direction this thing is going. So they're asking how many complete food chains are there in the food web shown above. Well, as we can see, every food chain has to start with the plant. So we know already that we have two food chains here starting with the plant, right? However, with this one, when we go to the second trophic level, this food chain, these food chains branch off. So you have two food chains here. You can go either this way or you can go this way. So that means you have two plus one. So now we have three food chains, okay? So that's question six. Let's go to question seven. All right, which of the following is the main advantage of recycling? All right, so we know recycling is about taking products and taking the material out of them and reusing it. So, for example, recycling glass. You take the glass from, say, um, a bottle. You crush it. You take the glass and you can use the glass, the material itself, again in another way. All right, so therefore, we know that... Uh, it says a main advantage because as we can see there are many other advantages this one not particularly because one of the disadvantages is that depending on the material the quality does go down a bit so you sometimes you can't use it exactly the same uh, in the exact same way okay so we continue right so we have here yeah sorry about the noise there um, what else we can say for sure? Well, we know that it does save on raw materials. Okay. This not necessarily because, um, again, it all depends on the material that you're using, right? And recycling does involve a lot of, um, you, it does require an input of energy. So it's not necessarily cheaper. Okay. Not across the board. Recycling creates jobs. That is a possibility. Again, it is a possibility. But again, whenever someone is promoting the use of recycling, the main one that we want to focus on is this one. Saving on raw material. Because the whole idea of recycling is that you wouldn't have to be going and using the raw materials and, and basically depleting those resources that those raw materials come from. You reduce the amount that you're using. So that's the most important aspect of recycling. Yes, it could create jobs, but there are lots of other environmental friendly actions and policies that would create jobs. Okay. So the answer here would be B. All right. So let's go to question eight. All right. So question eight, 50 grams of a fresh sample of oil, repeatedly heated and cooled, etc. So this is, is describing an experiment. So this is an experiment, okay? And the purpose of constantly heating it up, notice that, notice the temperature. This is very important because an experiment with soil that uses heat can do one of two things. It's either you are reducing water or you are reducing the organic components. All right, so the temperature is very um important here. So since it's really close to the boiling point of water, then we can say that most likely the component that's being eliminated here is water. Now, in some cases, 
the other option of course the organic which would be the humus but if you want to burn away the humus the temperature will have to be higher okay and the other clue as well is this a desiccator a desiccator removes water all right so in other words you're cooling it in the desiccator and the idea is that as whatever water is evaporating out of the soil and um, is going to be pulled out of the air or pulled out of the environment with the desiccator you also don't want that as the soil is cooling that it basically reabsorbs water from the surrounding air so that's why you would place it in a desiccator to ensure that whatever water is removed stays removed okay so that's why that's the second reason why b is your answer so let's go to part nine question nine i should say which of the following are effects of pollutants on coral reefs in the caribbean so this one what i should just like if you get a diagram the first thing you do is you look at the options don't worry about the a b c and the yet look at the options first so it's asking you which are effects of pollutants all right so we know that increase in macroalgal and sea grass growth is true. Less reef fish is true. More branching coral is, is up and down. Um, some there are some cases where you have we have a shift in the um species distribution in a coral reef, but in terms of pollutants, which usually has a eutrophication effect. In other words, you're dumping a lot of nutrients into the water. Um, that usually leads to this kind of effect. Okay, and we fish, of course, depend on the coral. So what will happen is that if the, the what happens is that the water starts to get very um, less translucent or less transparent. And certain other species would die out, and the reef fish would not be comfortable there anymore, so they would have less reef fish. So it's one and two, not so much three. So our answer here is A. Okay? Alright, so let's go to question 10. Which of the following practices may be used in conservation or restoration? Once again, we have some options, so let's look at the options first. Okay, so restricting hunting seasons, not really going to apply. Well, sorry, we're looking at general ecosystems. Okay, yeah, this could work. Planting of mangroves, definitely. Quarrying to remove limestone, well, that's actually going to be harmful. So that's definitely a no. So the options we have are one and two. So which one of these says one and two? C. Okay, so the answer to that is C. Let's go to 11. Alright, so 11 is asking, refers to the following diagram. So again, you look at the diagram first. What are we looking at here? We're looking at change in population over time, starting around January 71 or earlier. Right? Um, and we have January 8, 80, 89, 98, and 07. And we have here population in millions. So we're seeing that over time there has been a change in population size. And they didn't say what country. Okay, so we'll just say for uh, you know arbitrary country, I guess. So let's look at the question. Which of the following most likely accounts for change? In population size from January 1980 to January 1989. So we're looking at from here to here. So we know that there was a drop, a significant drop. So we're looking for factors that would cause or would influence a drop in population. Yeah? So what can we see here? Well, increasing contraceptive use would definitely affect would cause a reduced population because you have reduced birth rates. Alright. So less births. Influenza disease. 
here that can cause an effect, right? And decrease in fatal crimes. Well, if you have a decrease in fatal crimes, the population would go up, yeah? Right? So we know it's not three because the population went down significantly. If it has said increase in fatal crimes, then we know that that contributed to that drop. So it's one and two. Yeah, so that's what we have, A. Okay, so you see when you take that approach, it's a lot easier to figure out the answer. You look at the diagram, you look at the options, then look at the A, B, C, D. Okay, right, so let's go to 12. Which of the following organelles? Oh, come on, that is okay. Make sure you remember organelles, photosynthesis, the answer is chloroplast. Now, notice they put chloroplast and cytoplasm really close to each other. So, it means you have to read it carefully because a lot of times people will make the mistake because it's so easy. They get excited and they look for it and they choose cytoplasm because it looks like chloroplast. So, when you get an answer, a question this easy, be doubly careful. Be extra careful because it means there's some other little trick somewhere. Make sure and double check what you're answering. Okay? So, that's number 12 and notice it says directly involved yeah so that's also important to note question 13 okay so what do you find in both a generalized so we're not looking at specialized cells here a generalized plant cell and a generalized animal cell so we know a is out because only plant cells have a cell wall okay B is out as well because only plant cells have a cell wall. So we're between this guy and this one. But this one, only plant cells have a chloroplast. So C is out. So we're left with D, which is cell membrane, mitochondrion, and vacuole, which all cells, well, all generalized cells have. So the answer is D. All right, so let's go to number 14. The role of respiration is, right, so what happens to students sometimes? They will look at role and misinterpret it as process. And they would say something like um, absorption of oxygen or liberation of carbon dioxide or breakdown of carbohydrates, right? All of this is the process of respiration, not the role. All of this is done. The goal of all of this is to release energy. Okay? So the answer is A. Alright? So let's go to number 15. Right. So we have a nice big diagram here. Let me just, ma'am, reduce so I can get everybody in one big screen. Right. So we have a nice diagram here. At first look, we can tell this has something to do with diffusion and osmosis. And because there's a permeable membrane as represented by this here, can you see a dashed line in, in, a con in this kind of context? Then we're looking at a permeable, semi permeable membrane, right? So if it's a semi permeable membrane, we're looking at osmosis, right? Okay. So we start here on this side. We have concentrated sugar, dilute sugar, okay. And the large circles are sugar molecules and the small circles are water molecules. And I guess um this will be like a few moments later. Yeah, I can't do the accent. A few moments later, we have this situation. So something has happened. There's been a shift. So what happened? What happened? Well, we can't really count it, but we can take note of something. We notice on this side, the sugar molecules, the number of sugar molecules has not changed. Okay? On this side where you had the dilute sugar solution. But in a really quick review, we can tell that the number of water molecules on this side has been reduced and the number of molecules on this side, water molecules, has increased. So we can therefore say, okay, well most likely since the water molecules seem to have shifted, 
That means that water moved from the dilute sugar solution on this side to the concentrated sugar solution. But the sugar remained where it was, right? So now that we have looked at the diagram, we saw that it's a process, substances are moved in out of, out of cells, so it's representing what goes on in cells. So let's look at the question, right? Um, how many questions does this deal with? Just one, number 15. So question asks, which of the following correctly identifies and describes the process occurring above? Well, we know it's osmosis. So the, the A is out, C is out. Why osmosis? Because there was a semi-permeable membrane involved. All right? You had two regions separated by a semi-permeable membrane. The minute you see that, boom, osmosis. Okay? So now we have two options. We have osmosis B, osmosis D. What's the difference? Osmosis B is described, the description given is that water is moving from dilute to concentrated solution. Sounds like the correct thing, but let's just make sure. Part D, sugar moving from concentrated to dilute solution. Well, we know for one, the sugar didn't move at all, right? The same amount of sugar here, same amount of sugar here. And two, because of the semiperbable membrane, we know that for osmosis, osmosis is essentially diffusion of water across a semi-permeable membrane. It's not the movement of other solutes such as sugar, right? So therefore, we know the answer is B, okay? So now for number 16, which of the following best describes the nucleus of a cell? Please, please pay close attention to this word. Best. Okay, so before I even read the options, it means that you may come across a, a situation where two answers are really close in terms of describing or describing this structure. You have to choose the one that is the best description. Okay, good. So let's see what it says. It is not permeable. Well, we know that's not true because nucleus literally has huge pores in its uh, membrane that allows the transfer of material in and out of the nucleus. It contains starch grains. We know that's not true for most species. That is something you'd find in, say, a chloroplast would have that. A chloroplast would have starch grains in it, right? It contains mitochondria. In most cases, no. No, because mitochondria is a totally different organ by itself. All right, so that's a no. And D, it stores genetic information in the form of DNA. Boom. So we know the answer is D. So let's go to 17. Which of the following substances is not necessary? Not necessary for photosynthesis to take place. Well, let's take a look. Let's go through the options. Water. Yeah, we need water. Energy, yeah, in the form of sunlight, right? Oxygen, oxygen is a waste product. So we don't need it. The process actually produces it. And we definitely need chlorophyll. So the answer is C, okay? So let's go on to number 18. After absorption by the ileum, Please remember, ileum is part of your small intestine. Okay. After absorption by the ileum, excess glucose is immediately converted to energy. Nope. Glycogen. Glycogen is a form of its what called animal starch well so it's the um animal form of starch basically you take the glucose and you create a polysaccharide with it and it is stored in your liver and skeletal muscles fat yes it does it is converted but glycogen comes first fat yes but again it is converted to glycogen first plus this one fat is not stored in the muscles it is stored under the skin so already C disqualified itself twice. 
All right, so our answer here is for B. All right, so let's go to part 19, number 19. Which of the following is optimum for the action of salivary amylase? Salivary amylase is in your mouth. So we know the temperature is between 30 and 40. So B and C is possible 40, 50. That's going to denature the enzyme and kill us. So don't even bother. A is a little too low. It's, it's, the enzyme will function, but it's not optimum. So between these two, how else do we know? Well, we're going to compare the pH. 9 to 10 pH is very, very alkaline. If it exists at all, if that level of pH exists, it will not be in your mouth. All right, your mouth is slightly alkaline, which is that 7 to 8 value. So your answer is B. All right, so let's go to number 20. Athlete suffered muscle cramps following his race. Muscle cramps are most likely caused by an accumulation of muscle cramps are due to anaerobic respiration occurring, which produces lactic acid. So that's C. Okay, oxygen, no. Urea, no. Excess glucose, no. Right, number 21. Okay, so as usual, we look at the diagram first. Let me make this a little bigger. Right, so we have here an experiment, yeah? And we take a leaf, and the leaf is exposed to sunlight, as we can see here, right? We have some foil on the leaf, and this leaf, and the foil has a nice little shape on it. Sees a little cutout, and the leaf, note that the leaf is still attached to the plant. Very important to note. All right, so we can assume here, we can determine that the area that is covered by the foil is that is where sunlight will be blocked. Right, so the variable that we are changing, so the variable, remember we have our manipulated variable, our manipulated variable here is access to sunlight. Alright, so now we have the um a few hours later and the foil has been removed and the test leaf has been tested for starch. Right? We know what happens if starch is present, blue black, so this is the positive, and here will be the negative. And the area that's negative corresponds to the area that was covered with the foil, right? So already we can uh, tell ourselves that this experiment was testing whether sunlight is required for photosynthesis because remember starch is a byproduct of photosynthesis. The only way you'll find starch in a leaf is if photosynthesis took place in that area. So let's go to the um, question. A likely explanation of this result is that covered part of the leaf died? No. So, no. Come on, we don't even look at the soil. Um, so we have two here. Foil pre prevented light. Foil prevented carbon dioxide. Well, we know it's not D. We know it's C. All right, so let's go to number 22. Which feature correctly distinguishes a phagocyte from a lymphocyte? Well, what do we know about each phagocyte? It carries out phagocytosis, which is it essentially eats, um, consumes um, foreign bodies, and lymphocytes, they tend to produce antibodies, right, um, that then work on the foreign agents in the body. So, let's go through each one. And girls pathogens, yes, no. Yeah, produces antibodies. Yes, no, well, we know this is because phagocytes don't produce antibodies. 
has a lobe nucleus. That's the other thing with phagocytes. They have a lobe nucleus. Formed in bone marrow. Yes and yes. No, because lymphocytes are also known as T lymphocytes. Why right, you have B and T lymphocytes? So yeah, that removes that answer because T represents the other part of the body where they are produced, named the thymus. Right? T for thymus. T is for thymus. Right? Not thyroid. <laughs> okay. Um, so yeah, so you have B and T lymphocytes. So um some of the lymphocytes are formed elsewhere. They're not formed in the bone marrow. Okay, but yeah, phagocytes. Yeah. All right. So let's move on. Okay. So let's go to twenty twenty three. Have a nice little tooth here. We have the various parts of the tooth. So we can label it right now. We have here the enamel. Yeah, and this is something you can do. Take a pencil and write. You have your dentine. You have your pulp cavity, and you have cement that helps to hold the tooth to your jawbone and your gum, right? So that's your tooth. It's a cross section of an incisor, yeah? So the region of the tooth sensitive to temperature is labeled, well, the dentine is sensitive to temperature. So the answer would be B. B, right? Dentine. Let's go to 424. Don't notice I'll speed up a little bit, okay, because of time. Right, so we have here diagram of respiratory system. One is the trachea. Two, you have your ribs. Three, you have the alveoli. Four is the diaphragm. Alright, and let's see what we have here. Which of the label parts represent the rib? Well, we labeled it already, so it's B. See the benefit of it breaking down the diagram first? Right, and 25. Which of the following activities is not correct? For the process of inhalation. Alright, well, inhalation, you are increasing the volume of your thoracic cavity. So, in other words, that means your diaphragm is going to contract and go down. Your ribs are going to move up and out so that the volume of your cavity will increase. Pressure goes down, air is pulled into your lungs. Alright, and it's asking what's not correct. Ribs move down and in. Well, we know that it's that's not correct. So let's take a little dot. Let's make this check the others to make sure. Air moves into the lungs. Yeah. So we know that's not the answer to the question. Diaphragm muscles flatten. Yes. When they contract, they flatten. They go from this shape to this shape. All right. And volume of thoracic cavity increases, as we just said. Yes. So that means our answer is A because this is not correct. What happens to inhalation is that the ribs do the opposite. They move up and out. Okay? So, again, very careful when you're reading these questions. 26. Which of the following options best identifies some of the transport substances in animals? So, in other words, what is transported from one point to the other in your body most likely most often in your bloodstream all right uh you have your amino acids yes hormones yes sucrose not so much sucrose if this was a plant then yeah but we're talking about animals so sucrose is a no so our answer is one and two only right good so let's go to 27. Ooh, we have a nice little diagram of a long, of a long whole circulatory system, man. Okay, let's take a look at it. All right, so we have our circulatory system. 
we know that any vessels that are leaving the heart, anything leaving the heart is an artery. Anything that is going to the heart has a vein, so that my right. And we have the major organs, and we have some some um, some vessels that are labeled. So one is that's to the heart, so that's your pulmonary vein. To hepatic portal from small intestines to the liver. And we have to the kidneys, that's your renal artery. And there's a vein because it's the indirectly heading towards the heart, right? So let's see what this is number three. So let's see what the question is about. Which of the following, let's make this a little big again. Which of the following correctly identifies labels? Well, we labeled them already, so let's go through it. Pulmonary vein. And nobody else says pulmonary vein, so you already have the answer. Just make sure hepatic portal vein, renal artery. Yep, so it's B. So you don't even have to go through the others. Just go through the others to make sure. And 28, a person whose kidneys have failed must undergo a process by which excretory materials are removed from the blood regularly. Okay, so we're looking at dialysis, right? And we are asking the question of why? Why is that true? Well, this is because what's happening with the excretory materials? Raise blood pressure, make the blood dilute. No, that's not, that's water. I'm not getting rid of by any other means. Uh, partially, you do lose some urea through your skin. Right? There are other ways by which you excrete, but the kidneys is the main way by which you excrete, especially urea. But this is the most important reason. Would otherwise accumulate and poison the person. So remember when I said that there are some questions where the answers are really close, but you have to look for the best answer? This is one of those. Okay? That the other and some of the other answers, for example, one of the indirect effects is that yeah, you're gonna have raised blood pressure. Um, if it's water that you have excess water, because maybe your kidneys get rid of water, yeah, it could make your blood dilute, but that's not really an excretory function. That's an osmoregulatory function. And are not gotten rid of. Yes, it's gotten rid of by other means. It may not be as intensive and effective, but there are other ways that some of these excretory materials leave your body. So D is the clue is the best and the most important reason. Right? That's the one that sends you to the hospital. Okay, that's the one that threatens your life. So that's why the answer is D. Looking at 29 now. So we're looking at the heart. It's cross section of the heart. We can tell where the atria are. Your ventricles. Your arteries. Right? And your veins. Pulmonary vein, aorta, pulmonary artery. Then a cover. Right? And we have two and one. So one is a ventricle that would be your, it's on the right hand side in the diagram. So that's your left ventricle. Okay. It's done in, it's flipped. And two will be your left atrium. So let's see what question is being asked here. In a patient with a certain defective heart condition, 
it was found that blood flowed from section 1 to section 2 above. This was most likely due to malfunction of, so that's where we're looking at the valve. So if, so that means when the heart pumps, contracts, it means that instead of all the blood going this way, some of it flows this way. So that means these valves here, these valves are not working as they should. All right? And those valves are known as your bicuspid valves. So the answer is D. The semilunar valves are these guys over here. Right? You'll find them in this area as well in, as in veins, within the vein, right? Especially those veins coming up the legs in order to keep the blood flowing in one direction. But we're looking at bicuspid valve for this guy over here. Number 30. Following statements describe some of the stages of the clotting of blood. Okay. So let's see if we can figure it out without looking at the options. We want to get the sequence. Okay. So what is the sequence? Platelets are activated. Prothrombin converted to thrombin. Thrombin converts in a clot is formed. Right? So it's 1, 3, 2, and 4. Right? So let's see. And the answer is B. That's the one that fits. Okay, good. Again, I'd be discussed on repetitive. That's the procedure. Don't look at the options first. Look at the diagram or the, the list that they give you. Break it down, figure it out, and then see what your options are. Why is it difficult to develop a vaccine for the common cold? Um... This one, I'm just going to go straight through antibodies. Um, no, that's not true because then we wouldn't be able to overcome the common cold. Our body makes antibodies, so it's not that. The antigens on the common cold virus remains the same. No, because then making a vaccine would be really easy. Developing an effective vaccine would be really easy. The antigens on the common cold virus change frequently, yet yeah, that is a factor. And human beings cannot produce that. That's not true because then common cold would be killing us. It wouldn't be common cold. It would be fatal. Yeah? So therefore our answer is C. So let's go to 32. We have a cactus plant. The thorn is a reduced leaf. We have our stem. And we have our root system. Right? So let's see what the question is about. Which of the following describes the function of thorns? Well, why? So they're essentially asking, why is it a reduced or modified leaf? Why is it modified in this way? And the reason why it's modified is to reduce transpiration, right? Less surface area for less um, stoma for water vapor to leave the leaf. Right, via diffusion, especially where the cactus usually grows in very hot conditions. In those conditions with a normal leaf, water will be leaving the leaf at a pace. So you have a modified leaf with very little stoma, very, very few stomata, I should say, and you have less transpiration. Okay. The function now, this is like the how. How does it reduce? Right? This is, has nothing to do with what the thorn does. Ward off carnivores. Yes, it does that as well. But its main role is to see, remember I said, two answers are usually close. It does help to ward off carnivores. But the most important function of the thorns is to reduce transpiration. Because if I'm losing water and getting dehydrated as a plant, uh, I least of my concerns would be the carnivores because I'd be already dead, right? Because 
I would literally lose all my water and would not be able to survive. So that's the priority. Okay, so 33, which of the following rows? Right, metabolic are uh, excreted that are excreted by plants and ass. Okay, so you're comparing ex um, excretory substances basically between plants and animals. Okay. So plants, no. Plants do not um, have urea as a metabolic, as an excretory product. They do, however, have tannins and calcium oxalate, right? So it's between B, C, and D. This is out. However, animals don't have calcium oxalate, so this is out. Animals do not excrete oxygen. Oxygen is not a product that you get rid of. Oxygen is very important, so that's out. Water, yes, you do um, excrete water, and it is a metabolic product, right? Um, because, yeah, you do You go to the toilet, you urinate. One of the excretory products is water. And water is um, it's a metabolic substance, meaning that it's very much a participant in the various chemical reactions going on in your body. Yeah? So that gives us D. So D is the correct answer. Right. Number 34. Which of the following is least likely to be an example of growth movement in a plant? Okay. Closing of the leaves. That's actually not a growth movement. That's like if you touch a um, mimosa pudica, you're touching and it suddenly closes. That's actually um, managed by osmosis and other processes. Downward movement, that is growth. So that is growth. So the G for growth. Crawling, that's growth. Uh, yes, that's growth. So that means least likely, that's A. This is least likely to be an example of a growth movement. All right. 35. Which of the following about the skeletal system is not correct? Okay, so this is correct. It does protect delicate organs. It, mm, non-living. Hmm. So let's put that question mark by that one. It produces red and white blood cells. That is true. It gives body its shape. Yes, that is true. So we're back to this. Non-living is the problem. The tissues that make up the bones are living. They are made up of living cells. So it's B. Okay. And the 36. You have a nice drawing of the upper arm showing the musculature. Showing flexing of the arm. Okay, so the so muscle Y would definitely be a bicep. Muscle X would be a tricep. Right? And of course this is where it would be connected to, right? So let's see what um what is asking. Which of the following occurs when the arm is flexed? Well, muscle Y contracts, muscle X relaxes. So, which one is that? So, right. So, we have here, so muscle X is relaxing. So, it's not A and it's not B. So, between C and D. So, muscle X relaxes, but muscle Y contracts. So, the answer is B. Okay. So, let's go to number 37. A uh, detectable change in the environment, internal or external, is called a stimulus, right? Response is how the organism responds to the change in the environment. Receptor is a part of the organism's body that detects the change. And effector is the part of the body that promotes the response, that facilitates the response. Okay, so that's the difference between all of those guys. A girl smells a hamburger. It's being cooked by her mother and she salivates. Which of the following is the effector which brings about her response? Well, if she's salivating, she's producing saliva. 
And the, remember, the effector is a body part. It's a body part. All right? So therefore, it's between B and D. It's not D because secretion of saliva is the actual process. It's the actual response. We're looking for the body part. And the body part is the salivary glands. So the answer is B. 39. We have some eyes. So we have an eye before, an eye after. The pupil definitely has gotten very, uh, gotten smaller from before to after. The iris, the muscles around that area has um, some the, the part, one part of the iris has contracted, right? The circular part of the iris. You have your radial muscles and your circular muscles, right? So the circular muscles contract, the radial muscles relax, and the pupil gets smaller. And this is response to light intensity, yes? It's not due to looking at something at a different distance. That one occurs at the level of your lens. The lens is either stretched or contracted, okay? This is dealing with your pupil and your iris. So that has to do with light intensity. So it's either A or B. And it says an increase or decrease. So we know an increase is what will cause that contraction. So it's A. All right. 40 refers to his skin, our favorite part. So we know for is the dermis. Right. You know, here's your cornified layer. You know, here's your dermis. Epidermis, sorry. Epidermis. And I think this is malfusion. Although I might forget. But that's what my memory says right now. And the region which acts in a similar manner, which is your sun protection will be your malphagian layer, which is three. That's where your melanin is deposited. Yeah? And the melanin will act as a sun protection for you so that you don't fry. Okay? Right, so 41. Which of the following shows how the defect can be corrected? So what's happening here? We have light that's coming from a distance. When the light that's approaching the eye is parallel, the, the lines that represent lights entering the eye are parallel, it means it's coming from a distant object. If the light was like this, the light rays were like this, that means it would be a nearby object. Right? Good. So this is telling you that the light is coming from a distant object and it's entering the eye but the lens is has um bent the light too much so that it does not converge on the retina right so this is someone who is short sighted right they can see nearby but they can't see far away and therefore, what kind of lens do we want? Well, we want something that's going to overcompensate. It's going to reproduce this effect, right, before it hits the lens. So that one would have to be a diverging, because that's what that is, diverging. Converging would be like this, right? So diverging. Converging. All right. So we're looking at either this one or this one. And bending of the light rays before it enters the eye, we want it to bend outwards because we were kind of make up for what the lens is overdoing here, right? So we want it to bend out so that when it does that, it would land on the retina. So the answer is A. Okay? Good. 
Now, 4.42. As I know, I wish I could spend time teaching it, but we're just going through the questions quickly. So, if you need to pause and rewind, do so, okay? 42. The following statements take place. A process is in the seed during germination. All right. So, as we said here, what does it ask? It's asking for a sequence of events. So, just like last time, let's go through the list. What's the first thing that's going to happen? First thing in this list is this one. The enzymes break down the proteins that stored in the seed to amino acids. Those so the soluble amino acids, those soluble products move into the embryo, and then the embryo uses that to grow, right? So that's what two, three and one, two, three and one. So where's two, three and one? There it is. Two, three, one. So the answer is D. Number 43. Okay, so what kind of diagram we have here? It's a growth curve. Right? It's a growth curve. And it's showing you that at first growth is very slow. And then it gets, um, is it exponential? No. But it's definitely rapid. And then it slows down. It flattens. Right? So it actually growth actually stops, right? No more growth, right? Um, so we're looking at what do we know growth is? Growth is a change in mass, size over time, yeah, and even complexity. So let's take a look at the what would be the y-axis if we're measuring growth over time. We already have time. We know that it could be mass. We just said growth is a change in mass. We know it could be change in size. Length is a component of size. And it can also be change in complexity. So number of leaves, that is, would be a count of how complex the organism is getting. So therefore, units of time would be incorrect because we already have that accounted for, right? So the answer is C. 44. All right, we have two different kinds of flowers, two different kinds of plants. So before we look at the question, just by looking at this in terms of pollination, we can tell this one is insect pollinated and this one is wind pollinated. Why do we know that? All of its major parts are outside, you know, fully exposed to the air so that the wind will be able to pull the pollen from it and will also be able to deposit pollen on it. Whereas with the insect pollinated flower, everything is inside the flower, so it invites the insect to come into the flower to collect some nectar and exchange pollen. All right, It doesn't want to be exposed to the wind because it wants that nice cozy space for the insect to come and do its job. Right? Good. So that's the insect versus wind. So which of the following is true? Both are wind pollinated when we know that's that's a no. Right? Petals are absent from both. That's a no. Right? Definitely you can see the petals here, right? Both are pollinated by a hummingbird. No, and that brings me I'm I'm sorry I didn't include that. This could also include bird or insect, some other organism. Right? So that's not true. I is pollinated by how many years? Two is pollinated by how many Correct. Because we already saw that from the diagram. Yeah? 45 and 46 is dealing with this diagram. So let's take a good look at this diagram. We have a baby in the womb. Alright, so we can definitely tell one from the... Okay, so this one is definitely the placenta. This one is the umbilical cord. This is your amnion. And the question is asking, the amnion is labeled? Well, it's four, right? That's this guy over here. Part D. All right. 
and the placenta. Well, we saw that already. Placenta is part two. Okay, good. So now four. 47. Not a consequence of plant or human disease. Okay, so we deal with either plant or human disease. So decrease in food prices. Decrease? Hmm. Not necessarily. It might faster get an increase. Loss of productivity, we know. Um, higher absenteeism, true. Larger part of national budget, true. So we know the answer is A. Because of the not. It's not a consequence of plant or human disease. Food prices will go up, not down. Right? Because you have reduced productivity. Yeah? One method of controlling the population of mosquitoes is by getting rid of all stagnant water. What stages of the life cycle does this method control? Well, the egg, the larva, and the pupa, all three function in the water is only when it gets to adulthood it emerges and it then starts to fly around and make people life miserable so we're looking at egg lava pupa everybody else included adults so that's b 49 production of new organisms from one parent alone is asexual reproduction mitosis will be the process by which you can facilitate Asexual reproduction, yeah? Meiosis is involved in sexual reproduction, the production of gametes. Which of the following is likely to be most effective in terms of, well, here we're going to look, thinking about the statistics. Yes, all of them are effective, but the most effective will be tubal ligation. Yeah, because that one is definitely almost, uh, almost an almost permanent um, solution to, to birth. So you only do that one if you're definitely sure you're not having any more children. Let's look at number 51. Two alleles of a gene are situated at, right, you have alleles of an I must egg. You can assume here they mean same gene. So if you have two chromosomes, I know this is really ugly looking chromosomes. If it's, you have your homologous pair, If they are alleles of the same gene, they will be on the same locus, same location. Alright? So, most likely it's A, but let's check the other ones. Different loci? No. Same locus on a different homologous pair? No. It will be on the same homologous pair. Different loci? Oh, definitely not. Right? So, the answer is A. Alright? 52. So 52, we have a much better drawing <laughs> of a cook of homologous chromosomes. And we have a diagram shows section of a pair of homologous chromosomes. And they code for hair color. So let's look at, we can definitely see that the alleles are different because we have allele A, which is common A, allele A capital. So we already know that this is a heterozygous genotype that we're looking at okay and we have a homologous same loci everything and there we go um it is heterozygous all right homozygous you have to indicate if it's recessive or dominant homozygous recessive would have been common a common a homozygous dominant would have been capital a capital e all right Let's go to 53, which is not true. Okay, so we have to be careful. Not true. So it allows a genetic variation. That's true. It results in the production of gametes. That is true. It causes haploid cells to form from diploid cells. That is definitely true. It doubles the number of chromosomes in gametes. Not true. In fact, the whole reason why meiosis is is to prevent that doubling of the number of chromosomes because that's not a very stable situation if every generation making gametes you double the number of chromosomes you're going to be in a problem yeah so yeah so the answer is d 
54. Two goats are two zygotes for fast growth rate are crossbred. The percentage of the F1 population which possess homozygous alleles is. Well, let's do a quick one. If they're heterozygous, it means that they are both, let's use the letter G. So they're both G, G. So goat 1 and goat 2, we do a quick connect square. We have G, 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 and G, G. All right. So which ones? And they're asking for homozygous alleles. So you're looking for your homozygous, recessive, and homozygous dominant. And that is this guy here and this guy here. So that's 2 out of 4. Just equal to 50%, yeah? And so therefore the answer is C, okay? So let's go here. Albinism is caused by a single recessive value, all right? Two normal parents have an albino child. This is because, all right, so if it's single recessive, the only way you're going to have an albino child is if it, the child gets the recessive allele from each parent. So if it's mommy and daddy, you have your A and your A come together. And that's how you get an albino child. So that means mommy and daddy had to both have this gene. But they had to have it in a heterozygous situation because they are normal so that makes them carriers it means that they carry the gene but it's not in a homozygous form so that means their genotype is each a common a right so that means the answer is a if they were both homozygous recessive then both parents would have been albino right both albino parents Okay, if one was homozygous dominant and the other was heterozygous, then you would not have any albino child. Right? What you would have would be carriers. You produce children with heterozygous. And if one was homozygous dominant, other was homozygous recessive, again, you would have had one normal parent plus albino parent. Right? But they told us that the two parents are normal. Okay? So B, C, D are out. 56. Which of the following correctly describes DNA, chromosome, gene, and allele? Okay? Let's start from here. Usually we could eliminate from DNA. DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic acid. It's also... The unit that codes for specific protein? No. It's the entire molecule that carries the code. So B is out. Nucleic acid that has all genetic information? Yeah, that's true. Nucleic, yes, that's true. And deoxy, yes, that's true. So let's go to the next one. Chromosome. DNA plus histamine? No. It's DNA plus histones. Alternate form of a gene? No. Or B is already out. DNA plus histones, yes. Smallest unit, no. So by process of elimination, we are already down to C. But let's double check. Gene, smallest unit of inheritance, true. Allele, alternate form of a gene, true. So we have the answer. 57. Okay, so we're looking at genetic engineering here. We're producing insulin by genetic engineering. Okay. We have a human cell. We have bacteria. We have chromosomes in each. We have plasmid, which also carries some genetic information. It's a lot easier to manipulate. So we're taking the plasmid. We take. We are splitting it. Right. And then we are going to take a piece of the chromosome, take that piece, combine with the open the plasmid to make a recombinant. 
plasmid that's then reinserted into a bacterium and the bacteria will then produce insulin using the code because the insulin code will be here. Right? So, in which of the stages shown in the diagram can insulin be produced by the bacterium? Well, it will definitely have to be at this point. When the new um, recombined plasmid, recombinant plasmid is added to the bacteria. And that bacteria can now produce insulin. So that's stage four. 58. A species is best defined as a group of organisms that can interbreed and produce fertile offspring. You must have these two, interbreed and produce fertile offspring. If you could produce a million offspring, but if they're all sterile, then yeah, you're not species, okay? Physically similar, again, that doesn't qualify, cannot interbreed, it doesn't qualify. All right, so let's look at 59. Which of the following is true about natural selection and artificial selection? Okay, so let's start. Natural selection occurs in domestic populations? No, so A is out. Because remember, we're asking what is true. Involves genetic modification? Yeah, kind of. Produces great biological? Yes, that's true. That's true. That, of course, this would be right by a natural means, like meiosis and exchange and so on. Faster process? No, not really. It usually takes many, 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 many years. We're talking about hundreds and thousands and millions of years. All right. Um, so it's not faster. So we are down to B or C. Artificial selection for B. Largely controlled by the environment? Definitely not. This one is what happens under human control. Produces very different organisms? Yes, that does tend to happen. So, our answer is C. Okay. And the last question. 60. Which of the following statements about genetic engineering and natural selection is correct? All right. Genetic engineering can change the phenotype. Faster than natural selection? Yeah. Well, let's check the others. Genetic engineering does not change the phenotype. That's not true. Genetic engineering does not change the genotype. That's not true either. Both genetic and natural selection do not. That's not true either. You change the genotype in order to change the phenotype. So our answer is A. And that's it for January 2020. Okay, so I hope that helps you all. Right, so all the best in your exams. I hope this helps. You know, go in there, mash it up. Please take note of the principles. Read the diagram carefully. Analyze the diagram. Analyze the list that are provided. Double check your answers, especially if the answer is looking really easy. If the answer is looking really easy, double check. Okay, and that's about it. All right, good luck. Bye.